This video focuses on the symmetry properties of tensors by looking at the definition of symmetric and anti-symmetric tensors. It includes examples of the use of anti-symmetric tensors and an example of its role in particle motion and conserved quantities involving killing vectors. All right, so for some four velocity u and a killing vector k, y is the following equation true. So I want to make this the focus of the video. Why is this equation true? And what we're going to find is that it involves over here this covariant derivative of the killing vector here, of the killing vector with a lowered index. This is an anti-symmetric tensor and this is going to play a role in why this equation is true, y equals zero. So what I um, so I'm coming to the definitions of um, anti-symmetric and symmetric tensors shortly, but I'm going to use this as my lead in my introduction uh, to these objects. Okay, so let's just go back a little bit. So we think about a particle in, in space time. So for some curve or world line of a particle in space time, we can parameterize its path in terms of some affine parameter lambda. Particle with mass, we could use proper time. Massless particle, we could use something like perhaps some other affine parameter um, such as path length. All right, so we'll have a diagram this shortly, but uh, the path followed by a particle in space-time. We just consider, for instance, that just a free particle, not subject to any forces. Um, such a particle will travel to geodesics. We'll come to that shortly. The four velocity of this particle will just be the derivative with respect to the parameter lambda. And that gives us the each of the components of the four velocity here. If we differentiate each of the components of the world line here. Now, just a short reminder on the directional derivative because that will help us in the first part of this equation above here. And if we just take the total derivative or the directional derivative of the four velocity components, so chain rule applies here, du alpha dx beta, dx beta d lambda. This part here, dx beta d lambda, is the tangent vector to the curve. And so we can call that u beta here. This, um, if we generalize this to the whole manifold, we end up with a covariant derivative. So del subscript beta u alpha, um, and often, you can see it written in textbooks and elsewhere in the form where u beta is put behind here to the left. Uh, it's a little bit more compact. Notice the boat, one beta up, one beta down, the index up, one index down, and then the four velocity uh, component u alpha. Okay. All right, so have a look. Here's our world line. And for a free particle, this is a geodesic. So free particle meaning no forces acting, it's just free to follow the curvature of space-time. So the path here, the red line here for our particle, parameterized in terms of the parameter lambda, which I've already spoken about. For a particle with mass, we could use the proper time. These are the components here. The four velocity is tangent to this curve, tangent to the world line, tangent to the geodesic in this case. There's a blue one here, and the four velocity is given by these components here the four vector, and notice the geodesic equation, this object here is equal to zero, or sometimes written in textbooks in this form here is equal to zero. And what that means is geodesics parallel transport their own tangent vectors. So they parallel transport the tangent vector, which means its magnitude and direction are held constant as it takes a small infinitesimal step from one point to the next along the curve. So if you're holding the magnitude constant and the direction constant, then you expect the derivative in the direction of the tangent to be zero. Or in other words, um, if we look here, here's the derivative of the tangent in the direction of tangent u beta, u beta is the tangent, right? That's zero because this vector is parallel transport along a geodesic. So geodesics parallel transport their own tangent vectors. And that means the uh, magnitude of the um, of the um, tangent vector is held constant, as is its direction. And this is expressed in the geodesic equation, which tells us the covariant derivative of u alpha in the direction of u beta is zero. All right. Um, one other thing here, um, when a killing vector is involved, this is the killing vector, that represents an underlying symmetry on the manifold and the Four velocity or and, and four momentum in the direction of a killing vector is conserved, and hence the d lambda 
of this scalar product is zero because in the direction of the killing vector, a quantity is conserved depending on, so whichever direction that killing vector is, then the four velocity in the direction of that killing vector will have represent some conserved quantity. For instance, you know, think in the Schwarzschild metric, the uh, metric is independent of time, so you have a killing, ve killing vector in the time direction, and so four velocity in the direction of that time vector uh, is zero, and that gives you conservation of energy. All right, so let's start with a few definitions concerning the nature of symmetric and anti-symmetric tensors of rank two, just for our examples. Okay, so let's start with a few definitions. So a tensor can be split into the sum of its symmetric and anti-symmetric parts according to T subscript AB, is this object here. Uh, of course, it also applies if you have upper indices. I'll just for definition purposes work here, but it similarly works the same with upper indices. Now the symmetric part is given by the parentheses. That's the symmetric part. Where there's a parentheses around the indices indicates that. And symmetric means that TAV is the same as TVA. You can interchange the indices. That's interchange the vector arguments and the tensor still has the same value. The anti-symmetric part is denoted with brackets around the indices, the square brackets around the indices. And that's this object here, a half TAB minus TBA. And I'll come to that shortly. So a fully symmetric tensor has the property that TAB, the indices AB here, is that you can swap the indices and the tensor has the same value. And for all upper indices, this is fully symmetric tensor. Same thing here, you can swap the order of the indices, it has the same value. While a fully anti-symmetric tensor has the property that when you swap the indices, the tensor takes the opposite value the negative of its previous value, the opposite value. Same with fully uh, all indices up. Uh, when you flip, uh, switch the indices, let's alter the vector arguments, permute them, uh, you get the negative of the value. Okay, so a general rank N tensor takes N vectors as its argument and is symmetric or anti-symmetric according to the permutation as vector arguments if its value is positive or negative. So the rules are for the symmetric case here, one over n factorial, n number of vectors as its argument, sum over all permutations of the indices a, b up to z, n number of them. The anti-symmetric case is the alternating sum, so plus minus, over all permutations of, a, b, of the indices a, b, z. Okay, so one on n factorial, n being the number of vector arguments. And that's uh, vector arguments or co-vector arguments, depending on whether it's upper or lower indices. So for example, for a rank three tensor, they're uh, finding uh, it's totally symmetric part, part and then it's totally anti-symmetric part. Well, for the symmetric part here, we're just gonna permute the different combinations, of the indices A, B, C, A, swap B and C, and swap A and C to get C, A, B, and so on like that. And when we, when we do that, we get all of these. Notice it's all sum, there's all pluses there. There's six of them, um, okay, the one over, um, when we get six, that's one over three factorial. So one over three factorial gives us one over six. Three times two times one is six, one over six. Here, um, rank three, the anti-symmetric tensor. Remember, it's an alternating, alternating sum, so plus, minus, plus, minus, and so on. Again, we permute the indices in the same way, uh, just with the alternating sum to take account of. Three vector arguments, hence three indices. So one over three factorial is one over six. Okay, two more examples now. Uh, here's a tensor rank four, or rank zero, four. Zero upper, four lower, okay? A is not touched, but it's anti-symmetric in B and D, but not in C. So the vertical lines are excluding C. So what we need is, is the, this is an anti-symmetric tensor, so it's gonna be a half times T A, B, C, D, original order there, and then we're gonna permute B and D. So we simply swap the order of B and D. So B and D are reversed, you get D, B, but A and C are untouched. Remember, it's excluding C, that's what the vertical lines represent. A is untouched, it's not involved in the um, uh, anti-symmetric part. A mixed tensor here where it's um, symmetric in AB, uh, anti-symmetric in CD. So let's deal with, um, with the symmetric part first, that comes first. So TAB here, TBA, okay, no change in the sign here. 
and we've left CD untouched for the moment. We'll go down to the next line and we'll expand each of those out. So let's deal with this anti-symmetric part now. So here AB remain the same, AB remain the same, but CD are going to be permuted. So CD, DC. Same over here, something happens over here. BA doesn't change, BA doesn't change, but CD do because that's anti-symmetric. Okay, uh, multiply it, factor out the half there. We get one quarter out here and we get this alternating sum below. So that's that tensor. It's expressed in terms of all its symmetric and anti-symmetric parts. Now, we notice that with anti-symmetric tensors, when you permit the indices, a negative value crops up. So let's have a look at what that means. So anti-symmetric tensors have the property of having zero elements along their diagonals. They're all along the diagonals of, uh, if you can write it out, the matrix array, they're all going to be zero. And they're going to be zero because of this anti-symmetric property here where when you permute the indices you produce a minus sign out front. So go along the diagonals, let's just take T11. Now if I permute that, I still have T11 but I've got a negative sign out the front. So how, how can that possibly be satisfied? And it can only be satisfied in the case where T11 is zero. That's the only way this equation here can be satisfied is if T11, the original value, was zero. And so all along the diagonals, you're going to see zeros. And an example of that is the electromagnetic tensor. Now it's along here, F00 zero, zero here, zero. F11 one, one here, zero. F22, two, two, zero. F33, three, three, zero. All along the diagonals, and all because of that um, property. Okay, so we can go a little bit further now. We're getting towards the original question that started the video. So let's take a fully symmetric tensor T alpha beta in upper indices. This is fully symmetric, so you can permute the indices, no change in value, and multiply it by fully anti-symmetric tensor A alpha beta. I'll put these lower indices just for argument's sake today. Now when we permute these, this tensor will change sign and change the value. So let's start now with the product of these two tensors, A alpha beta, T alpha beta. Now with the T alpha beta, I'm going to permute the indices there, so I end up with beta alpha. I haven't touched the anti-symmetric tensor yet, so nothing's changed. This is still equal to this because of the symmetric nature of the T tensor, our capital T tensor, or tensor T. What I'm going to do now, the third part here, is this alpha beta here, I'm going to switch that order. And when I permute those, I have to put a minus out front. Okay. So they've been switched from the second to the third term. They've been switched. Uh, tensor T hasn't been touched. And then next bit, what I'm going to do is I'm going to permute um, beta alpha back for the tensor T, so that doesn't change any because it's a fully symmetric tensor. And I'm now left with this object here is now equal to this object. Okay, so this object here is now equal to this. Okay, so how can I do that? How can that be true? Well, that can really only be true if the original object itself was zero. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking an anti-symmetric tensor, multiplying it by a symmetric tensor, and it gives me zero. Now, if you're not happy with that um, short proof there, we're going to do a little bit better. We're going to pick out an example. We're going to put some indices to these, expand out the whole, every single term in this sum, and we'll just see that they actually do cancel out. So we can see this by expanding terms for which we let the indices run from one to three. Instead of going zero to four, if I run it from one to three, there's enough terms in there to demonstrate the uh, what I'm talking about here. I don't need to have too many uh, terms of all. So I'll just run it from one to three. Okay, so here we, is our tensor product again. And we're going to write it out uh, with the indices from one to three. Okay, so here we go, expand these out. So we'll set alpha equal to one, and then beta will sum over one, two, three. And we'll set alpha to two, and sum beta from one, two, three. And then we'll set alpha to three, and sum beta from one, two, three. Okay, next thing. Now we need to apply, notice here, um, when we, this here, A11 has to be for uh, anti-symmetric tensor, has to be zero. So this first term here will drop out, as will this uh, fourth term here, a fifth term here, sorry, will drop out. And also this last term will drop out, the ninth term will drop out, A33 is zero, A22 is zero, A33 
Okay, so that goes in there. Next thing now, A12, well, A21 is the uh, negative of A12. Now, that, by anti the anti-symmetric property, is equal to minus A12. So let's write that down there, minus A12. Notice straight away that this term and this term will cancel out because T12, remember T was fully symmetric, so T12 will be the same as T21, but the anti-symmetric tensor A12 will be minus A12, which is which is going to cancel out. So this, this term here, second term here, and this fourth term here will cancel out. Similar things going to happen elsewhere with 2, 3. That is 2, 3. So this one and this one will cancel out. And A13 is the same as A31 reversed, and that cancel out, we're left with zero. So what we've ended up with is an anti-symmetric tensor multiplied by a symmetric tensor gives us zero. If we multiply it, we expand out each of the components, we can see that they cancel out. So that it justifies the previous proof from earlier. <clears throat> All right, next bit. So vector K equals K alpha E alpha. Expand this in the covariant basis is a or tangential basis, is a killing vector if it satisfies the condition that the lead derivative um, of the metric with respect to the killing vector k is zero. And this is the killing equation. Okay, we know that this is anti-symmetric because if we reverse the indices, we would get minus del beta plus k alpha. If we swap, in other words, if we take this over the other side, we can see that minus del beta k alpha is equal to this object here. When we substitute that in there, this thing goes to zero. So in terms of our example above, let the anti-symmetric tensor be del alpha k beta, is minus this object, is minus a beta alpha. So we see that this is a anti-symmetric tensor. The covariant derivative of the killing vector gives us a rank two anti-symmetric tensor. So returning to the original question, that is the purpose of this video, we have the directional derivative, dd lambda, which is, if you work it through, as I showed earlier, it is the directional derivative, is del beta, this object here, u beta, in the direction u beta, we expand that out, so the product rule applies here, the Leibniz rule, if you like, del beta u alpha times u beta k alpha plus del beta k alpha u alpha u beta. Now this one here, this part here, not including the, um, killing vector, but just this part here is the geodesic equation, which we know is zero for a free particle moving through space-time. It follows geodesics, and geodesics parallel transport their own tangent vector u alpha, so the change in that, the covariant derivative of that is zero uh, in the direction of the tangent vector, so that directional derivative here is zero times k alpha. And this bit here, this is the anti-symmetric tensor times the fully symmetric tensor, we know that's zero from the arguments established on the previous pages. And so this quantity here is zero. Directional derivative of this scalar product here is zero. Uh, total derivative of this scalar product is zero. And that shows that u alpha k alpha is a conserved or constant quantity in the direction of killing vector alpha, which is killing vector denotes an underlying symmetry on the manifold. All right, that's it.